So your audience, welcome. You may know me. I'm Maria Angela Pellegrini. I work for the UN Euroblonet. I'm the Education and Patient Program Manager. And I'm really glad to welcome all of you to this 10th session of our educational program named Euron Eurobonet Topic on Focus for Sickle Cell Disease and uh, Patients and Families and their families. So this is the second last uh, session. Uh, this program consists of 11 topics that have been uh, indeed selected by people living with sickle cell disease through a survey we circulated one year ago. And I'm very glad to introduce today's lecture that is Priya Pism. And with us, um, we have Dr. Rachel Kesseadu, uh, who was appointed as consultant hematologist at the Guys and St. Thomas Hospital. And of course, she's a specialist and an expert in sickle cell disease. Um, she's very involved in education. And uh, of course, her area of interest in sickle are cardiorespiratory, chronic pain, and urological complication. So please, Dr. Keseadu, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. This is a very kind introduction. Um, okay, I'm going to try and share my slides, she says. Um, yeah, so my topic today is priapism in uh, sickle disease. And um, my name is Rachel. I work at Guy's Hospital. Um, now, will this let me advance? Okay, so um, I, I don't need to tell this audience what sickle cell disease is. Essentially, you have a condition where your red cells become sickle shaped, they obstruct blood flow, uh, also get removed out of circulation early and cause all the problems of sickle cell. And I'm pretty sure everyone here knows about most of the problems of sickle cell, but um, I think we maybe don't talk about priapism in particular as often as we should. Um, so first I thought I'd play a video of an interview I had with uh, one of my, uh, one of the gentlemen I look after, um, who works with sickle patients at Guys and St. Thomas's Hospital, and I have a particular interest in the urological complications of sickle cell. Um, do you want to introduce yourself now? Sure. Uh, my name is Camille. Um, I am a sickle cell patient under Rachel. Um, Excellent. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your sickle in general, how it impacts you day to day? Yeah. So I think typically um, it's things like chest pain, back pain for me, um, and then priapisms um, as well as of more like recently over the last few years. Excellent. Um, so obviously the reason we're doing this um, recording is to try and share some education around um, priapism, um, because as, as you know, lots of um, young sickle patients know very little about it, and it usually comes as a surprise to people when they have their absolutely first episode. So the idea here is to try and educate about priapism. So uh, following on from that, do you want to tell us a little bit about your absolute first episode of um, priapism? Yeah, sure. So I think, so my first ever episode, I am was probably around 14, 15, something like along those lines. And I remember waking up, it being maybe two, three in the morning, having a prism and just not knowing what it was, what was going on, essentially, and not knowing how to get rid of it. Okay. Um, and how was that managed? Do you end up having to come into hospital at all? No. So for, I think my first few episodes, um, I, because I didn't know what it was and I didn't know who to go to for it. Like I essentially, so my, my like initial instinct was just to get up and like walk around and try to do exercise and exercises to try and get rid of it. Um, without like waking up my family or something because I didn't wasn't sure and I was kind of embarrassed about what to do about it. Yeah, absolutely. Um so inadvertently you use the right treatment without quite yeah. knowing it was the right treatment. Yeah. So 
that means when you had your first episode, you also didn't know what priapism was. No one had ever raised it with you. Okay. Mm-hmm. At what point did you then tell your parents and then your doctors about it? Yeah, so um, I remember telling my mum, this is what's happening, Um, it's not going away, and I don't know what to do. And it was, of course, like, um, you know, it was really early in the morning, so we... So I, I had just, you know, said, look, this is this is what's happening, and we, because she had cut, she come to my, she had come to my appointments with me, um, at that time, she had helped me bring it up, um, because I, of course, was, although I was fourteen, fifteen, like I was, not like, I, not the most outgoing person when it came to sickle cell, still, so, um. She, she did help me like say this is what's happening or like push me a little bit to say um what was happening at the time excellent so um how and how many weeks did you had your priapism before you first brought it up in your pediatric clinic um i it would probably have been a few weeks um at the time they weren't too frequent um so i probably had maybe two or three before it was ultimately brought up. Okay. Um, and how how straightforward was that consultation? Did you find it quite difficult or were yeah. you made to feel quite comfortable discussing it? Well, I think because for me, like because sickle cell and pyrophysms are very, I think they're very difficult topics to discuss, especially, you know, going through puberty and, um, you know, not knowing what was happening to your body, it's a, it's a very difficult topic to discuss in general. So I think now being told, okay, so this is what's happening, made me feel a little better about, you know, now I know what, what's happening and maybe the possible treatments. Um, and I, I think for me, like it, it was, you know, it's, it, it's still a fairly uncomfortable topic for me to this day. Yeah, naturally. Um, so then if you had to tell a nine-year-old with sickle what priapism was, what language would you use? How would you describe an episode of priapism to them? Yeah, so I think I would probably go along the lines of, you know, as you hit puberty and you start to have erections and um, uh, as someone with sickle cell, you might have something called a priapism, which is, you know, and, and use that kind of language. Like I, I think for me, like even as a nine-year-old, you, I feel, you know, I wouldn't want to be talked down to. Um, and I, and I think it's very important that they, that even at a young age, you know exactly what, where it is and what is going to, what would happen. Okay, fine. Um, so yeah, so the, the the way we describe it in clinic is obviously um, sickle cell affects your blood. Your blood gets everywhere. Mm-hmm. And one of the areas your blood gets into is obviously into your penis. Mm-hmm. When you go through puberty, it's completely normal for everyone to have a normal early morning erection. And that's all males, every single uh, man or boy has that from their um, puberty puberty right through all of adulthood Um, an early morning erection should not be painful if Mm -hmm. it is painful and you have sickle cell there's a concern that this may be parapism Um, so the idea is that if that is happening and is lasting certainly more than half an hour you need to tell someone about it Um, parents partner your doctors let them know and the things to do walk around have a drink of water go have a pee have a warm not cold shower um, exercise is normally quite good at diverting blood and making um, parapism settle down. If you had to grade the pain of parapism compared to other sickle pain? Um, I think for me, like, there is a very different pain to me, for me, like, in comparison to, like, my typical sickle pain. Um, so, like, 
um, and and I think because it is obviously a very sensitive area, like it, it's 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 it can be extremely painful, even in comparison to regular sickle pain. So I would probably let's hold on, probably out of ten. Yeah, like ten out of ten. Yeah, ten. Ten out of ten. Okay, so uh, that was a video um, I shot with one of my patients called uh, Camille, who's happy to have it used as an educational tool, just trying to talk about his experience of priapism. I feel we don't talk about it enough. Uh, well, that's my point of view. Um, let me just go back to my slides now and try and... Um... Okay, grand. Um, it's really sad because I have a feeling this means there's a video at the end I won't be able to share, but oh well. Um, right, so this is um, the biology of a normal um, penile erection. So within the penis, you have these three chambers and these two lateral ones are called uh, the corpus cavernosa. They're basically just spongy tissue that can expand and fill with blood or expel blood and then contract down. So for about 23 hours in the day for a normal um, uh, post-pubescent um, male, they will be filled um, sorry, they will have a low level of blood in them, so the penis remains flaccid. But for um, to, uh, when you, uh, the penile, a penis becomes erect, what happens is these two chambers become really filled with blood, and then they compress and they put pressure on uh, the blood vessels here that would normally empty them, um, including all these vessels here because they get so much bigger. So they reduce the outflow and that's how um, you normally get a normal penile erection. And they will normally, um, they can extend to the capacity of this, uh, this coat here, which is called the tunica. Um, so, with a normal erection, you either have vascular signals or neural signals, which lead to uh, the blood, blood uh, uh, becoming engorged within those chambers. And then those signals reverse, so the blood then exits and that uh, penis can become flaccid. What happens with um, priapism in sickle is essentially you end up with the blood within the Corpora, the large spongy bits get sickling, which obstructs being able to let go of the blood when you want the penis to become flaccid. And that's what leads to a parapism. So parapism is essentially sickling in the penis, full stop. Um, so in reality, for the person experiencing it, it's usually described as an unwanted and painful erection of the penis. Um, and if, if it happens for long enough, can lead to real damage within uh, the penile cavity. Other than sickle cell, there are lots and lots of other reasons why people can end up with priapism. So priapism is not unique to sickle, but the ischemic priapism, the sort of priapism sickle patients get, the highest uh, pres presentations are within sickle patients. So. Um, medications, you know, regular medications that we prescribe can sometimes cause priapism. This is in the non-sickle setting. So a blood pressure medication called doxacetine, for example, can cause it. Um, recreational drugs can account for it. Um, so marijuana can, cocaine is notorious uh, for causing uh, priapism. Again, this is in the non-sickle setting. There are certain kinds of injury to the penis which can cause it. Spinal cord injury can cause it. Some um, toxins from uh, spider bites can cause it and blood conditions including leukemias can present with priapism but of course we're here to talk about priapism in the context of sickle cell. Um, so as I said with sickle when you get priapism essentially your blood gets trapped because of sickling which blocks the blood flow out of the penis. So you end up with blood that is low in oxygen, so you don't have enough oxygen being delivered to the penile tissues. That causes pain, same as you would with a sickle crisis anywhere else. And if it lasts long enough, so you carry on not having enough oxygen going to the pipes, and then you will end up with uh, damage to uh, the tissue of the uh, penis. Pipism 
can happen in two different types. So there's what medically we refer to as stuttering preps. Them. So you can think of those as sort of like the warning before the big event. So this is when someone wakes up with parapism, um, it lasts much less than four hours, but they can get more than one episode in the one night, or they can get them a couple of nights in the week. Um, and these can be quite repetitive, but they all last less than four hours. Obviously they require, um, they do cause pain. They may require uh, mechanical interventions to um, help resolve them. So as Camille described, you can create what, well, we refer to as a steel syndrome. So you basically try and divert the blood flow away from the penis. So if you go and exercise or I don't know, uh, have a warm shower, sometimes having a pee um, will help. All those things will try and divert uh, the blood flow away from the penis and help restore um, the parapism down. But the the really worrying parapism is what we describe as fulminant parapism. So this is where someone has parapism that lasts more than four hours. At, with parapism of four hours, you should definitely be in a hospital um, looking for medical intervention to resolve it. Because the longer the parapism lasts, the more likely you are to run into trouble. So for example, um, if you have parapism that lasts more than 12 hours, a third of people will develop erectile dysfunction from that episode and may never be able to retain um, a normal penile function. And the longer it goes, the higher the risk of um, uh, developing um, uh, permanent erectile um, problems. But once you get over four hours, you are starting to damage tissue. So if, if you present after four hours or you have parapism that lasts more than four hours, but say less than six hours, there will be some damage to tissue, but you may initially not notice any difference in the quality of um, uh, the erections. But over time and with accumulation of damage, that can then lead to um, issues later in life. So what do we advocate um, for treatment of parapism? So as with all things sickle, keeping hydrated is a good thing. Um, the better hydrated you are, the better hydrated your red cells are, the less likely they are to sickle. Um, if you wake up with an episode of uh, parapism, we always advocate mild to moderate exercise. So most people will go up and down the stairs or do some press ups in their rooms go down, have a glass of water, go and try and pee. Um, all those things will usually resolve, result in resolution of the parapism. And of course, if that um, doesn't resolve, you could try a warm shower. And most patients who've had previous episodes can take medication um, to try and help resolve it because they will usually have medication at home for it. However, the advice I give to all my patients is if you hit the two hour mark and it's not resolved, start making your way up to the hospital so you get to us before you start entering that sort of vomit uh, parapism window. Um, and it's important to be aware that recurrent parapism, so just having lots and lots of stuttering episodes, can eventually lead to a degree of scarring, which is what fibrosis is. And over time, that can lead to erectile dysfunction. Um, the, the real problem with parapism is, as Camille said, is we don't do enough education about it. It's, it's quite a difficult thing for most um, young boys who are having their first episodes to talk about. Um, there is a lot of female representation in medicine, and it's a, a problem that uniquely affects boys, and they're having to talk across um, a gender divide, which can be quite difficult. Um, but it's important people are taught about priapism, made aware of it, because a third of patients who um, get priapism will end up developing erectile dysfunction if much is not done about it. Um, despite all I say, actually, we don't have that many treatments for parapism. Um, we don't have a lot of effective treatments. Now, if you present to the emergency department with full minute parapism, so this is the episode that's four hours plus and is still not uh, detumescing, you're, you, know, it, you still have an ongoing parapism, the way you're treated is pretty much as you would for any sickle episode. So you'll get pain relief, you'll be hydrated, you'll be oxygenated. And if uh, none of those things settle uh, the episode down, then they will normally give you an ingestion of a local anesthetic to the base of the penis, which is called a penile block. So it makes the whole penis quite numb. And then they stick a needle into the chambers 
I showed earlier and basically just aspirate the blood out, just literally manually take the blood out. And that can usually restore um, the flow, normal flow and the uh, penis will usually settle down. Um, if that doesn't work, then uh, there are procedures that they do in theater. So they, these are called shunt procedures where they essentially do the same thing. They try and um, make holes of increasing size to try and get rid of the sickle blood. Um, the, the hematologist usually leaves this to the urological surgeons, but when someone needs to go to theater or if we have time, we'll do um, some blood transfusion before you go to theatre. If we don't, when you come out of theatre, we'll usually do a blood transfusion to see if reducing your sickle blood will help settle the episode. But as you can see, you start off with a fairly um, small needle size shunt. And if that doesn't work, you move to a slightly bigger shunt, which is a needle that makes a slit within the corpora. And if that doesn't work, then you move to a slightly bigger knife and make a slightly bigger hole to try and get rid of more of the blood. Um, Treating the pyrophysil itself, there, there are medicines we can give. So if, when you tell us in clinic that you're getting these stuttering episodes, we do have medications we can give. So um, there is uh, there are a couple of um, medicines. They're quite similar to medicines you take for colds, actually, as uh, pseudoephedrine and etilephrine, which help relax, um, which, sorry, help contract the vascular um, tissues within the penis to try and extract, get rid of the blood. Um, Viagra, although it's a drug that is given to try and treat erectile dysfunction, there is some small evidence that it can also help treating priapism. And we've had success with a couple of patients in our clinic, but it's not it, it, it's not uh, the answer to all, all uh, problems. And then you can be given antiandrogens, antitestosterone medications like cyproterone to try and treat a priapism. But sometimes the side effect of that is while you're on the medication, it can take away your daytime um, erections, which is not um, acceptable to everyone. Then obviously we treat the sickle itself because the reason you have the priapism is because you have sickle cells. So almost everyone in our clinic who has recurrent priapism is either on hydroxycarbamide or blood transfusion. Um, what space the newer treatments are going to occupy as far as um, pyrophysm is concerned is, I guess, we're, we're still watching the space, essentially. There is some small um, and gathering evidence for both of the new therapies, and there's a clinical trial ongoing at the moment using CRIS, which is the infusional therapy, um, uh, which we're hoping will report uh, in uh, the international meeting in uh, December 23, so next year or the year after, to tell us if quinzaluzumab treatment will be enough to reduce uh, priapism. So that trial is recruiting uh, largely in the States at the moment. Uh, so in summary, priapism is a painful and unwanted erection of the penis. It can be caused by sickle cell, and within this talk, that is what we're focusing on. If you get priapism, it's important you alert your medical team to it and they start discussing treatments with you because priapism left untreated can result in erectile dysfunction later in life. If you have an episode that lasts more than two hours, it's a good idea to start making your way towards the hospital because once you breach that four hour mark, you start accruing tissue damage. And your medical team are, are aware of this complication. So please do um, speak to them if um, you or your uh, child uh, reports a uh, pregnancy. Now, I'm going to try, because I'm on a different device. Hi. My name is Leon. I'm 13 and I love... Can you, can you hear the sound? Yes, yes. Ah, perfect. Football. I also have sickle cell, which most of the time isn't a problem. But I want to tell you about that one time. You know in sickle cell, when you have a sickling episode, it's because all the blood cells change from being round to kind of sharp and pointy. And when this happens, instead of flowing smoothly, throughout all the blood vessels around the body, some of the sharp pointy cells can get stuck in the little blood vessels and cause a blockage. The first time this happened was when I was younger. I woke up with terrible pain in my leg. It was the worst, but that's not the one time I want to talk about. You know when I said the sharp pointy cells can get stuck anywhere? Well, I mean anywhere. And that one time, 
They got stuck in my penis. Yeah, you heard right. My penis. And that day, when I woke up, my penis was already up before me. Nothing unusual there. It goes up. It goes down. A mind of its own. Usually, it goes down after I go for a pee. Except it didn't go down. Usually it goes down. But it didn't. And it kind of hurt. I had a shower. It didn't go down. I had my breakfast. It didn't go down. And now it really started to hurt. And I only had two choices. Go to school or tell my mum. Yeah, I know. Worst day ever. But she was great. She said I needed to go get checked out at the hospital. So I put on my baggy hoodie and I brought a book. When we got there, my mom spoke to the receptionist and we got seen very quickly by the nurse and shown to the room to wait for a doctor. She gave me some pain medicine and put some cream on my arms so that they could do a blood test. I got an oxygen mask. She took my blood and gave me a drip. I still couldn't read my book. When the doctor arrived, he asked me all about my penis and I told him it went up, it went down, it went up and it went down. It went up, but it didn't go down. He explained that if you have sickle cell, this because of the sharp pointy cells getting stuck in the blood filled spaces in the penis. He said it's normal for blood to go into the penis. It's what gives you direction. And yes, they go up, they go down. But if they go up and don't go down again, it can be a problem. He said it was a really good thing that I told my mom and we came to the hospital. I felt better with the painkillers and the oxygen. And my doctor said I was lucky because a little bit later, I could read my book. Yup, it went down. I had to stay in for a couple of days, just when my sickle cell started to settle down. And while I was there, my specialist nurse came to see me with the doctor. They told me this could happen again. Sometimes it will go up and down, and sometimes it will go up, but not go down straight away. Usually, if it happens in the mornings and it doesn't go down, when I empty my bladder, I should watch out to make sure that it does. If it goes down in less than 30 minutes, it's all good. But if it stays up for more than an hour and it's painful again, I need to grab my baggy hoodie and come back. They said it's really important that I don't leave it too long. The longer you leave it, the more damage the sickle cell can do to your penis. And we don't want that. So, that was that one time. I hope it never happens to you. But if it does, you need to grab a baggy hoodie and come to the hospital. Okay, um, so uh, that video clip is only four minutes long, but it took us about nine months of work um, to put that together. But um, the, although the language is a little bit um, childish, um, we chose to make it pediatric appropriate because we figured the earlier you start talking about this, the better. We think adults can still get the information they need from it. Um, which is why it's aimed at peds. And also I've, I generally find pediatricians don't like talking about anything to do with um <laughs> anything to do with any, yeah anything to do with that might have any impact or conversations around sex just because most of their patients don't need it um so then a lot of the young boys I come across who've had purpose the first time they just weren't aware of what it was so the hope is that this video means you get people before they get their first episode so it's a familiar thing that's the hope anyway anyway that's all I had well, indeed, congratulations for the work of the video it was very clear and I think very, I mean, it targets a lot the aim of raising awareness and giving like um, instruction or best practices to follow in a very simple way. I found it very helpful.
Um, so um, we have some time for the questions and we are going to finish a little bit earlier. So we have two questions in the chat. I'm going to address it. Um, the first one, is there any clinical interference between the treatment of priapism and sickle cell treatments in terms of combined side effects or effectiveness? Um, so, it, I mean, obviously, if you treat the sickle, the hope is that you get less of the priapism. So sickle treatments themselves are a good thing. Um, Hydrea, we think, has a little bit extra when it comes to treating priapism because it may have some effect on the uh, actual blood vessel. That treatments for priapism, so the drugs that we use specifically for priapism on the whole don't affect um, the sickle cell. So they're, they're, they're these drugs that um, they're alpha, they're basically the side effects of the first two pseudoephedrine and etilephrine, you can get, um, your heart rate can go a bit fast and your, um, uh, so you can get palpitations and you can get high blood pressure. So those are the things we watch out for, but it doesn't trigger um, sickle crises, no, not at all. And with cyproterin, which is the anti-hormone treatments or other treatments that way, I think um, those who get really severe priapism are generally just grateful to get a break from um, anything like that, but um, those who get stuttering priapism can sometimes find it quite difficult if when they're on the drug, they lose daytime erections as well. That can be a little bit tricky, um, but not everyone does. Everyone is a little bit individual in how they respond, but none of the treatments themselves trigger sickle crises, no. Thank you. Um, so we'll go straight to the second one. Is there any role for exchange transfusion in the acute treatment of sickle cell disease related priapism? We don't use it, but I wonder why it wouldn't work. Yeah, so but priapism is 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 a slightly curious complication. So in my service, I have about uh, seven or eight guys who are on exchange transfusion purely because of priapism, because they have problems with priapism. But that is not enough um, for all of them. So I have some patients who have gone on to exchange and they're, they're fab. They just never get priapism again. But I have patients who are on the exchange program, really well exchanged, who still manage stuttering at home. To be fair, no one on the exchange program ever comes in with fulminant priapism but some of them still get um, stuttering. So there, there is a role that the vascular endothelium plays in um, sickle priapism that we, we don't entirely understand because the pathophysiology of priapism is still, like, we're still working on it in all honesty. Um, so when you come acutely that the treatment is urological, we deal with the penis and then we deal with the sickle um, because what we want to do is essentially get normal blood flow through that penis, make sure the tissues are, are healthy and then we get rid of the sickle blood. So we wouldn't exchange you and hope that's enough to settle the priapism because organizing an exchange takes a few hours and what you don't want is for someone to add hours and hours and hours where they have not good oxygen going to their penis. So initial treatment is definitely surgical. They aspirate, get normal blood in, and then if it's not settling, then we sort out the exchange. Um, one very last question, then we close. What advice would you give uh, to an older patient constantly having priapism and feeling embarrassed even during hospitalization? I was curious so, because usually we find when people come into hospital because they receive oxygen, most people are on oxygen, we, we have much lower episodes of parapism in inpatients. So one of the things I didn't mention there is one of the links we're aware of is people who dip their oxygen overnight are more likely to get parapism. Um, so usually if you're in hospital and on oxygen therapy for a crisis. Most people actually have fewer, um, but I think if you're getting priapism, even when you're an inpatient on oxygen, you definitely should talk to your doctors about it because it's there's so many medication options to try, so many. Um, and the, the other thing with priapism that um, the medical uh, teams have very little awareness of is it people become sleep deprived because of priapism because they're waking up at two o'clock and having to exercise, go back to bed, wake up again at four o'clock, exercise again. There's a lot of impact. So just talk to your sickle doctors. They, they know about it. They will treat it. They will respond in an empathic way. 
Thank you. Thank you very much.